Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this session as a part of uh, Western Research's 2021 virtual conference. Uh, my name is James Shelley, and I'm um, apparently in, in, unable to operate a PowerPoint. There we go. My name is James, and I am a knowledge mobilization officer with the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences. I also uh, hang around a bit with the uh, folks over in the Department of Geography, uh, and I'm also the, uh, I guess, project lead for the uh, Complex Adaptive Systems Lab uh, here at Western. I'm joined today by uh, Kate Wallace and Jonathan D'Souza, who will uh, who will take on kind of the second and uh, third uh, tri of the triad of the session. Um, so just in kicking things off, what we're hoping to do today uh, is to, as uh, clearly as possible, articulate and illustrate the characteristics of a complex adaptive system. Uh, we're really trying to, in this uh, stage, just be as uh, straightforward as, as possible in describing uh, complexity. And we wanna think about how taking a complexity or a systems uh, approach uh, might open up new avenues or new perspectives in, in a program of research. And uh, lastly, we hope to discuss a little bit about the, um, the, the work of our, our lab or our group as a, as a place for cross-pollinating some ideas between uh, disciplines. Before we go any farther though, uh, we want to acknowledge that the University of Western Ontario is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Nananawate, and out of Wanderant peoples. These lands are connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people, First Nations, Metis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And every time we discuss uh, complexity, uh, complexity systems, uh, it, it keeps dawning on me that you know there's there's so much about where the discourse on complexity and systems has has taken us over the last several decades that has so much resonance um, with what we might also describe as indigenous ways of, of knowing or, or uh, more generationally oriented approaches to to seeing the world and, and that that parallel is 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 fascinating uh, to me and and, and brings home the fact that you know, knowledge is not always about generating something new, but also building upon what we have learned. My job uh, before uh, handing over to Kate and Jonathan is to do a brief introduction to complex adaptive systems. Uh, and there are many ways of introducing complex adaptive systems. I feel like I'm still uh, searching for the best <laughs> way to do this, uh, but one way that I often find helpful is to think about the characteristics uh, that different complex adaptive systems might share in common and to work backwards from there. So imagine with me, if you will, uh, some cells, could be the cells of any living organism, uh, a colony of ants and a city, some large metropolitan human populated area. These are all obviously different things. They're different phenomena, they're distinct, they're unique. Uh, but from a complex adaptive systems perspective, we might ask, well, what do these things share in common with one another? Or what parallels can we observe uh, in, in their behaviors vis-a-vis -vis one another? So probably if we were to brainstorm a list of these kind of parallels we'd see, we notice that interactions play a key role in how these entities exist. So there's the there are elements or components or agents, different terminologies are used that interact with one another. These interactions uh, occur in a multiplicity of ways and they form some kind of web or a network. Uh, none of these <laughs> phenomena can exist without interactions. As a result of these interactions, we see what we might call emergence. So the whole is different than the sum of its parts. We could take an ant apart. Uh, dissect it thoroughly, that would not give us a, a clear understanding of you know, what that ant would specifically do as a part of their colony if their colony was flooded, per se. Which is to say simply that understanding a single entity uh, cannot provide a reliable uh, prediction of how the system as a whole is going to behave. 
as a result of that, the system is also, also clearly dynamic. And so the whole system will change with time. Time being a property of constant change. The change, the system can move from a stable state to a chaotic one and vice versa, but it's always dynamic. We probably notice that there is some element of sort of self-organization involved uh, that in, 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 in the most objective terms, control is somehow decentralized or it's distributed in the patterns of interactions. As a result, these systems can recover when, when part of it, when part of them or uh, an element of them are perturbed. And then we see this, uh, we see non-linearity occur. So a relatively small change in one part of the system can lead to a disproportionately significant impact across the whole system. Uh, think one little ant who finds something poisonous, how that impacts the colony. Uh, think about one cell that decides to go rogue. Uh, think about a tree that lands on a power line. All examples of one small change affecting the system as a whole. I'll say more about feedback loops in a second, but a key component of complex adaptive systems are the presence of feedback loops so that the output of the system either has a positive or a negative uh, implication for the replication of those inputs. Come back to that in a second. And signal flows, uh, which is another way of saying information and where and how information is distributed has significant impacts on how the system uh, adapts and evolves and behaves. From a more physics oriented perspective, it might be helpful to think about uh, complexity using this analogy. We can start with a room full of an empty room that's full of nothing but air. And then if we were to think about how all those air molecules are behaving, you have a state of chaos, high entropy, uh, no order whatsoever. On the other end of the equation, we might imagine a lump of coal, for lack of a better analogy. Maybe a frozen lack of lump of coal would be the best analogy. Something that's uh, very, very stable, high equilibrium, low entropy. This thing we call complexity exists in this uh, kind of magical middle ground where it exists in a state of disequilibrium uh, because it has this metabolic um, relationship, this metabolic consumption of energy that ultimately thwarts uh, entropy, at least temporarily. So if we were looking for some jargon on a Monday morning, because who doesn't love jargon on a Monday morning, uh, we'd probably hear a complex of the system described something like a dynamic nonlinear network that emerges in the interactions of many, ent of many entities. These influence and react uh, to one another. It's adaptive because it has this um, set of relationships between semi-autonomous, uh, heterogeneous, diverse connected entities that form these interdependencies that adapt and evolve. Uh, the world of complexity sciences is, has been around from around the 30s, 40s. Uh, it's evolved in very many unique ways. This is probably an incomprehensible infographic when shared on Zoom. Uh, but a couple of things that are interesting to note here is this relationship uh, between system sciences, natural sciences, and what began as cybernetics and then grew into the world of, um, of computation uh, and, and data manipulation. Uh, so these things have kind of been interacting and overlapping all the way through. And also interesting to note that a, a lot of the more recent work on complexity uh, has been pretty applied. So asking, okay, we have seen and we're observing these, these phenomena in systems. How do they, uh, how do these observations uh, shape how we think about our system, the global system, the human system uh, moving forward? So asking this question then, what are some questions that we could explore in, in any program of research if we were to to as intentionally as possible adopt a complex systems lens, what could be some questions that we could, we could open up and explore. Uh, Kate and Jonathan will really uh, flush this out in their programs of research, but at a high level, I just wanted to share a couple of examples that hopefully uh, sets them up. <laughs> so one of the questions we can ask is what keeps a system self-correcting? So, uh, looking at the domain of whatever it is that we're researching uh, from a systems lens, we could be like, what are these feedback loops? This is an example of a negative feedback loop in that it is self-correcting. This relationship we have between 
uh, foxes who eat rabbits and rabbits who are food for foxes. So obviously a higher rabbit population equals more foxes, more foxes puts a higher dent in the rabbit population around and around it goes. Uh, infinite number of examples. If you know, we could think about, uh, if we were to put this in, in human systems, uh, what's the relationship between hospital beds and hospital funding, for instance, um, markets, what's the, you know, how does the relationship between the price of banana and the supply of bananas uh, operate? Uh, these kind of feedback loops are everywhere. But we know, of course, that foxes and rabbits um, don't just live in a vacuum of foxes and rabbits, uh, they live in an ecosystem. And so an ecosystem then uh, forces us to pull the zoom back a bit and see that foxes and rabbits are a part of a very uh, dynamic, complex adaptive system that is also informed by other complex adaptive systems. And another question would be then, well, what are these mappable relationships in the system that we're exploring? Uh, recent, the, the watching what's happened in Afghanistan uh, this weekend reminded me of this causal map that was uh, developed by the US military in 2009 as they were trying to figure out uh, what to do in Afghanistan. Uh, and again, this is not, <laughs> not a map made for showing on Zoom meetings. But it was an attempt to try to figure out, well, if you make one change over here, you know, what are the knock-on effects of that change in other parts of the system? So trying to map those relationships, trying to understand those, uh, and then capture that in a, in a visual way. The point of this is not to argue that the US ever figured out what they were doing in Afghanistan, but it's an interesting example of the complexity that emerges when you try to think about as many overlapping uh, influences within a system of systems. So from a research development perspective, uh, asking, you know, what system is my system in? What are those other inputs? And what are the consequential outputs uh, of, this of these relationships? What is running amok in the system is another way of asking, what are the positive feedback loops? And we don't mean positive in complexity sciences as if uh, they're necessarily a good thing, we mean they're not self-correcting, so there's nothing holding them back. A simple human illustration of a, of a positive feedback loop would be a rumor when person A tells person B something they've heard, he tells person C, and then person D, uh, person C comes over and tells person A, and person A is like, ha I knew it all along, uh, thus reinforcing the feedback. Uh, climate change, what we're seeing right now, what we're even seeing this summer, uh, and then kind of a textbook example of a positive feedback loop, obviously. Ice melts, less light is reflected, water gets warmer, more ice melts, there's nothing uh, holding it back. Uh, finances, rich people uh, earn money on interest, poor people pay money on interest, and uh, and unless there is another uh, feedback loop that self-corrects it, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. How, how does information change the way a system behaves? Those signs that you see on the highway as you're driving down the 401 that simply say, you know, slow after the next two exchanges, for instance, uh, that changed nothing about the infrastructure of the highway. It changes nothing about the amount of available road space, the amount of available uh, traffic volume of the existing uh, vehicular infrastructure. Infrastructure. All it does is change who has information, access to what information, and when. And as a result, the system can uh, adapt accordingly. And of course, there's all those interesting studies where they take people's, you know, power meters and take them away from the side of their garage or the side of their house and put them in their front hallway, uh, simply by the changing how and when people uh, perceive information can actually ch actually change. Um, quantifiably change behavior in relationship to energy, as an example. So in the world of complex adaptive systems, information and behavior uh, often, uh, not that they're the same thing, but they're often inseparable. And then finally, uh, where and when, another question we could ask is where and when uh, does this system organize itself? If we were to think of a hospital as a complex adaptive system, 
uh, you know, we might notice that the hospital has an org chart, has a, uh, has a bureaucratic structure, uh, but, you know, that system, that chain does not necessarily predict my, um, my personal experience of the healthcare system uh, when, when I enter it. For instance, I might meet a doctor or a nurse who's having a particularly bad day. That particular, their particularly bad day might be the result of, you know, some other interaction within the system. Uh, so if I'm the CEO of a hospital, I could like email everyone in the hospital and say, hey, everyone be nice to the patients or I'm going to fire you. That might not really have the, uh, the intended uh, effect and it just points out the fact that the hospital is a little bit in a certain sense, it's like a flock of birds in that each part of it is, is, is behaving in a way that is informed by the other components around it. Uh, Sarah Crescentio's work, uh, who's a part of this uh, lab on uh, health healthcare team behavior uh, is a really, really great example of, um, of a deep dive into, uh, into that question. So there are some questions and I'm going to uh, stop uh, sharing here, turn it over to uh, Catherine, uh, assistant professor, Center for Global Studies at Huron University College to uh, explain how she uh, uses some of these theories and questions in her research. Hey. Great. Thanks so much, James. Um, just let me get my screen up here. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, James? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So um, before beginning, um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank James uh, for inviting me to speak at this event. I'd also like to thank the folks at um, Western Research for hosting a conference that showcases um, all of the wonderful research being done um, at Western and its affiliates. Um, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge that um, this project about which I'll be speaking today is um, funded by a SHRC New Frontiers in Research Fund Exploration Grant. Um, and this is a grant that supports high risk, um, high reward interdisciplinary uh, research. Okay. Um, my presentation uh, today is titled Soil as a Relational Medium, a Complex Adaptive Systems Approach to Human Soil Relations. So throughout the presentation, hopefully what I'll illustrate is um, how complexity and systems thinking informs my research program. And um, I'll pay special attention uh, to the project Soil as a Relational Medium. Um, so just a quick overview of my agenda. Um, I'll begin with a brief introduction to my area of specialization and some of the key influences um, in terms of complexity thinking. Uh, next, I'll introduce my program of research, uh, my overall program and describe sort of um, three major research portfolios. Following this, I'll zoom in um, on uh, one project in the environmental media portfolio. And um, after this, I'll talk a little about how complexity and systems theory informs this particular project. And finally, I'll give some sense of future directions and implications um, for this project in particular. Uh, before I continue, I would also like to begin by acknowledging um, that Western is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawak, and Attawandran peoples on land connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish With One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse um, Indigenous peoples who are its original uh, con and contemporary stewards. And uh, we recognize that Indigenous peoples have a long-standing relationship with this land that's grounded in respect and reciprocity. Um, for Indigenous peoples, in land, land is not uh, a resource to be extracted and exploited, but a relative whose teachings are sacred um, and central to Indigenous ways of knowing and being. So we hope that our understanding of soil as relational honors this way of knowing and being and contributes to the renewal of respectful relationships with Indigenous communities. Um, at the same time, we recognize that 
research um, has contributed to historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada. In this regard, we acknowledge our responsibility as researchers for ensuring that the knowledge produced um, is produced in collaboration with Indigenous communities and works to both correct historical wrongs um, and serve the needs of these communities. So here I'll take a moment to introduce myself and my relationship to complex um, adaptive systems and theories of complexity. Um, as James uh, um, introduced me, um, I'm a, an assistant professor at the Center for Global Studies uh, at Huron. And my formal training is actually at the um, Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism um, at Western. And uh, there I um, studied critical and cultural theories along with a number of interdisciplinary um, approaches borrowed from diverse disciplines, including geography, anthropology, philosophy, literary studies. Um, so it's difficult to me, for me to imagine being a global studies scholar uh, without having some relationship to complexity and systems thinking. Um, after all, what is globalization if not some sort of complex adaptive system? So three significant influences in my methodological approach uh, include world systems theory, um, as well as cognitive mapping and the double exposures framework. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these um, and I think it'll give you a sense of uh, my overall uh, research program or at least how it's informed by complexity theory. Carlos Martinez Vela defines world systems theory as quote, a macro sociological perspective uh, that seeks to define the dynamics of the capitalist world economy as a total social system, end quote. This systems theory is generally associated with Emmanuel Wallerstein, um, the American sociologist and economic historian, and it's meant to undermine the dependency theory of um, international development, in which rich countries simply um, exploit poor countries in the periphery. And Wallerstein famously um, took the world system and not the nation state as the primary unit of analysis, which changed his overall understanding of the various kinds of flows that took place in this world system. Uh, next, in a general sense, uh, cognitive mapping is um, simply a mode of representing mental concepts. Marxist literary theorist Frederick Jameson extended this definition to the social realm by defining it as a process that, quote, enables a situational representation on the part of the individual subject to that vaster and properly unrepresentable totality, which is the ensemble of society's structures as a whole, end quote. So I'm sorry, I know that's kind of a long and complex quote, but essentially Jameson is saying that cognitive mapping is a mapping of relations between subjects and the broader social structures that constitute them. So um, here uh, I have pictured the work of American neoconceptual artist, Mark Lombardi. And this traces structures of power, capital and cognition. Um, and it's a good example of how we might represent cognitive mapping. The piece here is pictured, uh, that's pictured here is um, titled uh, George W. Bush, Harkin Energy and Jackson Stevens circa 1797, or sorry, 1779 um, to 90. And it's the fifth version of this work. Um, and it represents, according to Italian architect um, Bosco Lucarelli, quote, the alleged connections between James Bath, the Bush and Bin Laden families, and business deals in Texas and around the world, end quote. Um, finally, the double exposure uh, framework, which I have pictured here, and is represented by this um, graphic was uh, developed by geographers, Karen Lychenko and Susan O'Brien. And it captures the ways in which um, the interactions between two significant global change processes, globalization and climate change, increase human insecurity, especially in developing nations. So um, if I were to put this differently, Lychenko and O'Brien are basically mapping uh, the compound effects of these global change processes and the kinds of feedbacks loops that are produced by different kinds of inputs. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute to talk about my overall research program and then I'll, uh, as I said, zoom in on one particular project. Um, 
so my overall research focuses on uh, a number of things, but memory, culture, environment, and mobilities or migration um, in a global capitalist context is the sort of overall um, uh, program. And as I mentioned, I draw on quite diverse methods in um, my research, including historical and archival investigation, um, semiotic and discourse analysis, direct observation, interviews, um, and uh, community-based research is a, a big part of my research program. Uh, and I draw on these methods to examine um, the changing and uneven environments of natural and social spaces, something to that effect. Um, so my research falls into three main portfolios, uh, memory economies, environmental media, and sustainable migration. And each portfolio contains some um, current and future projects at various scales and durations. So I'll just start by um, describing memory economies. Uh, in this portfolio, I investigate the relationship between memory and capitalism with an emphasis on the entangled histories of preservation and dispossession. So historic and cultural pres preservation and primarily dispossessions of land. Um, in the second portfolio, environmental media, um, I focus on mapping human environment relations with the aim of facilitating just and sustainable futures. And in the final portfolio, sustainable migration, um, I examine the intersections of uh, migration, climate change, and sustainable development in the Canadian North. Uh, so these are sort of uh, the three main portfolios, and you can probably already sense that um, all three have some kind of relationship to complex adaptive systems. Okay. So here I'm gonna zoom in on one project that I think best describes uh, the ways in which complexity theory and systems thinking inform my research. And this project is called Soil as a Relational Medium. So this is a um, collaborative transdisciplinary tra and transdisciplinary project um, and it focuses on conducting uh, multi-scalar analyses of human soil relations. So that's the primary aim. Um, our team includes researchers from uh, global studies, myself, um, communication arts, anthropology, um, uh, and soil science. And we're based at Western University of Waterloo and um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Our uh, primary research question is what does a relationship to soil looks like, look like outside of the productivist paradigm in which soil is primarily a resource to be extracted and exploited in the production of surplus value or profit? So some related questions include things like how does information um, flow between human and non-human elements of relational soil systems? What are the mechanisms of communication that facilitate this flow, and what kinds of epistemologies or worldviews structure these flows and mechanisms? Um, and perhaps something like what uh, kind of impact do they have on human soil relations? So um, we believe the answer to these kinds of questions requires us to adopt a relational view of soil. So um, this understanding of soil, uh, see soil not as a unified um, object, but a set of social and material relations that vary through time and across space. Uh, so in other words, we're interested in soil, both as a living entity uh, comprised of a variety of different elements and organisms, but also as an active participant in a larger social system. So um, accordingly, we're studying multiple field sites that demonstrate this active um, what we're calling human soil kinship and embrace soil as a living body. So the COVID pandemic, of course, as it has for everyone, has made it a little bit difficult to um, uh, collect data. And we've had to make some alterations to our work plan and timeline, uh, given that we haven't been able to travel to some of the sites. So we um, located this farm, uh, Sunnyview Farm, which is a bi biodynamic farm just um, outside of London, it's located in Ailsa Craig, which is about um, 35 minutes northwest of London. Um, and it's a really excellent starting point for our project. So we're using it as a pilot. 
Um, there's uh, sort of four main reasons we're using this. Uh, first, part of its mandate is to improve the health of the soil, um, to establish food and financial security for uh, the farmer, and to make connections between the farm and the broader community. Uh, second, the founders of this particular farm, who are pictured here, um, Alex and Eleanor, are German immigrants who came over in the 1990s. And they embraced the anthroposophy of Rudolf Steiner, um, who was a German uh, philosopher who invented biodynamic farming and also the Waldorf School of Education. Uh, third, the farm is connected to a long-standing tradition of biodynamic farming in Canada. Um, it's also connected, interestingly, to a, a global social movement committed to removing land from the market economy and revitalizing something along the lines of the agricultural commons. Um, the, the last reason that this particular space is really important for us is that the socio-political and economic story of the farm spans multiple scales and we think warrants very detailed um, investigation. So um, because of this multi-scalar multi uh, dimension, uh, we think things like um, the German roots of Sunnyview can't be um, sort of separated from the troubled history of German socialism, um, its dedication to the preservation of land um, as a common good has to be situated within the settler colonial history of Canada, um, as well as the greater global economy. Um, so we, we're already taking sort of um, a multi-scalar approach to this very local space. Uh, so if I were to summarize, I would say that the farm um, is located within a nested series of complex adaptive systems that includes the local ecosystem, the national and international spheres of agricultural production, um, local and global economies, and so forth. Um, and some of those will become clear um, as I uh, talk more about the project. So we're using this project to refine our methodology, which we're calling relational materialism. And I'll, I'll sort of gloss over this fairly quickly. So if there are questions, I hope that you'll um, feel comfortable asking. Uh, this is an inductive methodology that draws on historical materialism, uh, grounded theory, and fractal theory. And it draws on these theories to examine the human environment patterns across multiple scales. So like historical materialism, it begins with the real conditions of existence, so how people live on the ground, um, but it extends these to non-human entities um, and uh, takes the real conditions to mean not uh, human labor, but socio-biophysical relations. Um, it uses a grounded approach to theory, uh, which moves from data collection to theory development. Um, and it borrows from fractal theory, the principle that um, complex systems or complex patterns are self-similar across scales. So that's sort of our, our um, foundational uh, concepts or theoretical framework. And we are, our main aim is to create what we're calling um, an expanded soil profile. Uh, so this profile will include biophysical properties of the soil, the stories of soil practitioners like Alex and Eleanor, um, but also the soil scientists that we're working with. So they are also sort of our research subjects, um, as well as the broader uh, historical and material conditions that help to shape the soil in a given location. So of course, these include things like, um, you know, uh, industrial capitalism, globalization, um, those kinds of uh, broader systems, social systems. Um, so here I'll, I'll try to bring together some of the complexity theory that um, James was talking about at the beginning and um, soil itself. So um, we understand soil as a complex adaptive system. Um, that is, um, and I'm quoting James here uh, uh, from the CAS uh, lab website, a dynamic and nonlinear network that emerges in interactions of many entities that influence and react to one another. Uh, and we can discover um, how soil works as a complex adaptive system by starting with the question, what is soil? Um, so this is one of the questions that we started with. And um, the soil science 
Society of America answers this uh, in the following way. Um, soil is the unconsolidated mineral or organic material on the immediate surface of the earth that serves as a natural medium for the growth of land plants. So this is kind of a foundational scientific de definition. And indeed, soil is um, a, a life supporting mixture of organic and inorganic materials, air, water, uh, in fact, it's about half solid, only 5% organic, um, and about 25% uh, equal parts air and water. Um, it emerges over extremely long periods of time from parent materials uh, below the Earth's surface, and over relatively short periods of time um, through human and non-human contributions from above. So some of these might include compost, fertilizer, um, vermicast or worm droppings, and uh, fallen fruit, fallen leaves, things like that. So it's both um, highly stable uh, and highly changeable. And it's considered to be um, a non-renewable renewable resource, uh, despite the fact that um, it does have this uh, sort of short-term uh, input. So to understand how it operates as a complex adaptive system, we can ask some of this, the questions that James highlighted in um, the introduction. So I'm gonna take this question um, as an example, what is running amok? So this is another way of saying this is what are the positive feedback loops in soil systems themselves? Um, of course, uh, soil erosion is sort of a classical example. Um, and uh, in this diagram, you'll see that, um, Decreasing vegetation uh, leads to soil erosion and nutrient loss, which then causes more vegetation to die and the cycle continues, right? So it's a sort of positive feedback loop that um, uh, continues the problem of soil erosion. Um, such a feedback loop could lead to a number of follow-up questions regarding how to correct the erosion um, within the broader social context, but the solutions are often partial insofar as they don't account for the impact of other complex adaptive systems or other kinds of inputs. Um, back as far as uh, 1973, geographer and um, sort of the father of uh, political ecology, Pierce Blakey, had already recognized that the problem um, of soil erosion is not only a scientific problem, but actually a social problem. And he was, of course, working in the context of international development. So our research places the complex adaptive system of soil within a series of other complex adaptive systems. And I'll just use two as examples here. There are many, uh, but of course there's the natural ecosystem and then the human made um, system of social and economic globalization. Uh, feedback loops within and between these systems influence the degree um, or the capacity for what soil scientists are now calling soil health. Um, and this concept of soil health has replaced the concept of soil quality, which in itself is interesting. And I'm not gonna get into the relationship um, between uh, soil health and human health, but that's another sort of um, branch of uh, my research that focuses on um, uh, the ways in which research on the human uh, microbiome or the gut uh, intestinal flora actually um, influence the concept of soil health. Um, but to stick with the feedback um, systems or the complex adaptive systems I have here, the feedback loops within and between these systems um, can be understood in a number of different ways. So if we focus just on the soil itself, um, erosion might be a, a result of decreased vegetation. And this, um, we, we, might, we may or may not know the reason for this, um, but if we move to the level of the ecosystem, um, we remember those fox and uh, rabbit diagrams that James had uh, on the screen. Um, it might be associated with uh, sort of a, a, an influx of a certain kind of invasive species or something like that, right? Um, so uh, it also might be associated with water runoff or heavy rains due to changes in climate, um, which are, ex it, these accentuate the decrease in vegetation and then continue the cycle. But if we move to the level of say globalization, we might start thinking about um, how the decreased uh, vegetation might be effects of um, human uh, 
impositions, right? So maybe those invasive species were brought to the location by humans um, and, uh, or, or maybe the land was clear cut um, to make it arable for farming. And perhaps this farming, um, as Christina Lyons shows in her study of Colombia, um, perhaps this clear cutting is, is, um, ha has something to do with laundering drug money. Um, so often fields are clear cut uh, to, to um, bring in cattle, which then serves as a cover um, for laundering, um, which might be further associated with um, some of those um, uh, connections that uh, Mark Lombardi was making between government corruption and um, uh, US trade or even US arms production. Uh, and all this is to say that understanding the, the ways in which the connections among these nested um, complex adaptive systems work is crucial to finding um, problems. And this is part of the argument of our project um, that to problems that um, seem to be exclusively environmental problems. Okay, so um, we're starting, of course, uh, with Sunnyview Farm. This um, will be a comparative study or part of a broader comparative study of relational soil systems, um, is what we're calling them, uh, in order to determine what is self-similar across them. So we want to understand how human soil relations are organized in relational understandings of soil. Um, in the future, we hope to conduct a similar study of non-relational soil systems, um, such as those perhaps found in industrial agriculture, to similarly determine what is common among them and how they organize human soil relations. So this will lead to an overall broader study between relational and non-relational soil systems in order to consider um, whether and how relational soil systems might provide insight into um, solutions to say socio-environmental problems. So this is a very small component of a, a hopefully a very um, large study. So um, the last thing I'll talk about in terms of future directions um, is, uh, so back at the beginning I mentioned fractal theory, uh, which demonstrates the ways in which complex patterns are self-similar across different scales. Um, and uh, it suggests that localized patterns should be able to be scaled up and vice versa. Um, so we're hoping to use small scale uh, localized data sets uh, to develop a method of analysis that can be scaled up um, to determine larger networks of human soil relations. Uh, so, and one example, um, this might entail, um, say the creation of a digital interface, which is um, you know, becoming sort of more popular to gather user generated data to map what we're calling the expanded soil profile. So uh, here users could upload various forms of data, including GPS coordinates, soil profiles, uh, oral narratives, photographs, videos, maps, um, I could go on. Uh, there's all kinds of things that users could upload and these inputs could be then um, collated with researcher generated data on things like global economic fluctuations or um, historical geopolitical events or um, various cha global environmental changes. Uh, and this is really just one example of um, sort of the future directions we imagine for this project. So um, I'll close here with the final question and say that um, we're very interested in expanding our collaborative network um, and invite you to imagine how your areas of expertise might uh, help to answer the following question. What kinds of soil, or so, sorry, social, material, human, and non-human relations interact to produce and maintain the medium we call soil? So I'll leave you th with this question uh, and close my presentation here. And um, I've just included at the bottom of this slide um, contact information for myself and my co-PI uh, in case you're interested in collaborating or uh, learning more about the project. Thank you so much. Okay, shall I hand it um, over to, straight over to Jonathan? Sounds good, thank you so much. Sure, okay. why not? Thank you, Kate. I'm gonna share my screen.
and sound, hopefully. Let's see. Okay, I hope you can all uh, see that. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jonathan D'Souza. I'm an associate professor in the Don Wright Faculty of Music. Um, I'm also an associate member at the Brain and Mind Institute. And I'm gonna talk to you today about musical ensembles. And um, in some of my current work, I'm starting, just starting uh, to think about uh, musical ensembles as complex adaptive systems. Um, so I'm very much at the beginning of this uh, kind of line of research and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, kind of as a beginner, this might help uh, some of you here uh, to think about how you might enter into this, um, uh, this kind of way of thinking as well. Uh, okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm just going to kind of think a little bit about what uh, orchestra means um, in terms of, uh, you know, a kind of a case study of a, of a, of a large and uh, common uh, musical ensemble. Um, then in the middle, I'm going to uh, think about orchestras as complex adaptive systems using some of the, the terminology that James introduced in his presentation and that Kate also uh, engaged with in hers. And then in the final section, I'm going to um, show you a little bit of what I'm doing using network analysis and, uh, and some, some tools related to that. Uh, to think about um, uh, patterns of coordination in, uh, in orchestral music. Uh, first of all, though, uh, like my colleagues, I do want to also uh, acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, uh, Lenapewak, and Adwandaran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon covenant wampum. This land uh, continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And here I want to just add, you know, a as a musicologist and because I'm going to be speaking uh, to you today mostly about uh, Western classical music, European classical music, uh, uh, I, I just want to also, you know, add to this acknowledgement by saying, uh, you know, these indigenous peoples have um, very old and and still living traditions of music, art, language, culture, uh, which have been devalued and uh, harmed by settler colonialism and white supremacy. So you know, I'm I'm going to talk about uh, you know Western classical music because that is my main area of expertise, and I'm not qualified uh, to 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 speak to you about indigenous music. But I also want to acknowledge right out uh, at the bat, um, you know, these. Uh, these musics are incredibly rich, incredibly valuable, um, and um, and I think this is you know something that that people in my field need to think about is how our field has historically and today been complicit uh, with um, you know with the the violence done uh, you know uh, on these things. So I'm you know this uh, I'm going to talk about Beethoven, but I don't want to suggest that Beethoven is somehow like the best music or anything. I think that is a um, a vicious uh, that would be a vicious lie. So I just want to be like really, really clear about that. Okay, so I want to talk about the orchestra and there's really no such thing as the orchestra. Um, orchestras are uh, different in different times and places. So what we have here is a, is a representation of, uh, of the composer uh, Gustav Mahler uh, in early 20th century Vienna. He had a famously large, large orchestra, um, but his he kind of, uh, ensemble was very different from the first uh, orchestras in, uh, in Europe that emerged uh, in earlier periods, which were much smaller, which had uh, fewer instruments. You know, some of the instruments that we see uh, in this painting were not even really invented 
at the time when or orchestral music uh, started to emerge. Orchestras are also not limited to classical music. We see the term orchestra used in jazz, uh, so big band jazz, uh, the Count Basie Orchestra is a, is a famous example. Uh, we see the term used as well in other genres. So, you know, prog rock, we get something like the, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And there are many, many different types of orchestras in non-Western uh, musics. Um, so here is uh, the Hong Kong uh, Chinese Orchestra. And Chinese orchestras are, uh, modern Chinese orchestras are very well established uh, using instruments like the erhu and the pipa and so on. Uh, but this is really just one example. Um, uh, there are many, many other types of orchestras around the world. And more recently, we even get things like laptop orchestras are, are fairly common. Uh, where the uh, participants are, are using laptops as kind of musical instruments and uh, they're all connected in, in various ways. So all of these are quite different in terms of the sound of the music that they create, the, the technologies that they used to create it. Uh, but in each one, we have a large ensemble. Um, we have an ensemble where all these players are coordinating somehow together to create uh, music together. Um, and I'm really interested, I guess these are kind of my driving questions, right? How does a, a large ensemble, uh, how do the players in that ensemble coordinate with each other? Uh, how do they interact? Um, you know, what kinds of relations uh, make that uh, ensemble music possible? Um, now, that's, so that's in a sense what I mean by orchestra, uh, you know, a, a large ensemble. Um, but um, it, orchestra kind of has a, a cultural meaning as well. I've started to notice how it's often used as a metaphor. Um, so we get in, uh, in cognitive psychology and neuroscience, we get uh, talk about orchestrating brain networks, right? Or you see the you know this title, a symphony in the brain from Jim Robbins. Other uh, other you know uh, people thinking about the brain since the 1990s basically have used this as a metaphor uh, for for brain dynamics. Uh, but in fact, this is a very old metaphor. This uh, metaphor of the kind of orchestral brain uh, is found in the early 19th century uh, in phrenologists and craniologists uh, uh, from that time. Um, so this is a kind of long-standing uh, metaphor comparing uh, large ensembles in music with, uh, with human minds. Um, you get a similar thing with the orchestral metaphor in Laban movement analysis, which is uh, related to dance in a way of kind of thinking about the moving body. Uh, there you get people saying, you know, the, the, orchestra, uh, the body is like an orchestra, right? It has many parts that can work together, but each part can kind of have a solo or be kind of, they can be in counterpoint with each other somehow like that. Um, so that's another place where you get this metaphor. I was watching a documentary about Amazon and in there they were talking about the Amazon Fulfillment Center as a, a you know, being like an orchestra uh, that all of the, the people working in, in the center are like the players and that they're being directed by an algorithm, uh, which is uh, like the conductor. I particularly like this one because it makes me uncomfortable. And I don't want to suggest, uh, as I think I was kind of already alluding to, I don't want to suggest that the orchestra is a, you know, a inherently wonderful thing. I think it's very complicated and the uh, questions around power and culture and so on are, are things I can't get into today, but I think it's good that, you know, uh, to have to see how this orchestral metaphor, um, you know, isn't always necessarily uh, something wonderful and harmonious, uh, like we might, uh, might want to think. In each case, basically, the orchestra is being used as a metaphor for some kind of complex uh, system, uh, be that the brain, the body, um, uh, a warehouse. So uh, we can, I want to kind of now kind of move into the second part and think a little bit, okay, we kind of have this, this as a metaphor. If we dig in a little bit, if we use some ideas from complexity theory, can we kind of start to, um, uh, to explore this 
ensemble and its meaning uh, in, in new ways. And so basically, um, this is, and this is hopefully a strategy that might be useful to you. If we take um, some of these terms, some of our Monday morning jargon from James, and we kind of try each one on, basically, you know, use it as a heuristic to see whether or not it, it kind of uh, makes sense with the, the, the phenomena that we're interested in. So complexity, is the orchestra complex? Well, yeah, I, I think it seems complex, right? It's very common for an orchestra to have over 100 players. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Everybody's coming with these you know, different instruments. Um, it does seem like uh, it's certainly much more complex than um, a duo or a quartet. There's a kind of just kind of slightly overwhelming scale of the thing. Um, what they're doing is dynamic, right? It's, uh, I mean, music is a temporal art form to begin with, but certainly uh, the patterns of coordination are changing throughout uh, in orchestral music. Um, and uh, historians of the orchestra, like Emily Dolan, have talked about this, that really the emergence of the orchestra uh, is the emergence of kind of a certain kind of dynamic shifting kind of pattern of coordination. So in, in orchestral music, it's not just like one part always has the tune and one part is always accompanying, rather those roles of leading and following uh, are passed around. Um, and that is uh, a key part of uh, the practice of orchestration. Clearly there are many interactions happening here. Uh, the musicians are interacting with each other at various uh, scales um, and they're adapting to each other. Uh, so they are, uh, you know, if you're accompanying uh, another part, you're generally following that part and trying to match yourself to that part. Within uh, string sections, you're uh, trying to kind of match uh, your section leader and match your your partners in that section to to kind of match you know the the exact weight of playing things um, so you're kind of constantly shifting and trying to uh, either follow people and copy what they're doing or to negotiate something together so that you can kind of uh, come into accord with each other um, uh, emergence I think you know this idea that uh, that the, the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts makes a lot of sense for thinking about an orchestra, right? As a violist playing an orchestra, I, I usually start by, you know, I get my own part. Um, and in my own part, I simply have the notes that I'm going to play and where they are. Uh, I usually don't have a lot of information about other parts. And so I'll learn that part on my own. But then when I go into the uh, rehearsal, it's about understanding how that part contributes to a, a whole. And you can't predict what that whole is going to be necessarily uh, from your own part most of the time. Um, uh, so I think this works. And um, feedback loops, thinking about where things can run amok, I think is also very interesting. Um, we often get, well, this relates to another thing, which is kind of the question of self-organization. So we, there's often a sense, I think, um, you know, that the orchestra might be centrally controlled, unlike most of the uh, systems we've been talking about this morning that, you know, well, the composer writes down the notes, um, the conductor waves their stick and controls everything. And then, you know, basically it kind of treats the orchestral mus musicians as kind of, uh, you know, robots or, or something, you know, that, that they just kind of follow the directions and, uh, and, and the music comes out the other side. It's of course much more complicated because there are uh, levels of organization within the orchestra. So a string section, for example, has a principal who is the leader of that section. Um, uh, so there are kind of leaders within the orchestra as well. Um, occasionally we actually see conductorless orchestras where um, those leaders take on a, a bigger role and it becomes more like chamber music. Um, uh, but even, even with a conductor, um, there are times when the orchestra starts to do things that the conductor doesn't want us to do, right? The conductor may be keeping time at a certain rate and the orchestra may start to play slow, slower or faster, uh, depending. And um, this is something that just happens in rehearsals. You know, the conductor will just 
in rehearsals, the conductor will yell at you. In in the uh, you know in a performance, they'll they'll use gestures and facial expressions to try to get everybody back on track. But you can kind of uh, explain this in terms of feedback loops, right? If we're all subtly adapting to the other players around us, right? If we're listening to the sounds that they're making and then adjusting our action and our new sounds to match those, um, then you can start to understand how this rushing or dragging, this kind of going amok, as, uh, uh, as James and Kate put it, can happen, right? If somebody starts to push the tempo and they're in a position where people are kind of following them, um, we're going to go with them, right? If I hear that melody starting to rush and I'm accompanying it, I'm going to start to rush too so that I match it. Like probably whatever the com conductor is doing, you know, especially if it's in a, in a performance, I'm probably just going to kind of go with them, right? Um, then if I start rushing too and we all start rushing, that may, you know, then other people will start rushing more, right? Because we're all following that pattern together. Um, and next thing you know, we're going much faster than we, than we intended to. Um, and these adjustments are so subtle, they're based, they kind of feel unconscious, right? So that you feel yourself being pulled to play faster, even though you may be, uh, you know, uh, trying to resist it. This can happen in other uh, musical parameters as well. So this also happens with volume, where we end up playing too loud. If somebody kind of overplays, I can't maybe hear myself well enough where I know my, you know, my part needs to be in balance with theirs in a certain way, then we're going to match that loud volume. They might play louder to be over us. And again, we just end up playing uh, too loud and, you know, get the, the, the gestures like this from the, from the conductor who's trying to get us to kind of pull it back uh, dynamically and not just, um, you know, play at a loud volume for the whole time. Um, it doesn't happen so much in orchestras because the instruments usually constrain the pitch a little bit, but we get these, these kind of feedback loops in um, these positive feedback loops where we run them up in, uh, in choirs as well. You know, if somebody starts, you know, if you have a choir and one person sings flat, they might just be kind of out of tune. But when voices start to get tired, if they have no piano accompaniment, they will generally kind of shift down a little bit. Um, in, an, in a kind of imperceptible rate. And we all will adapt to each other as we're doing that. Um, and we can lose quite a lot of pitch over a long composition, uh, a long unaccompanied choral piece. It's not uncommon at all for that to end, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit lower uh, than it started. And again, I think we can understand that in, ter in terms of this, you know, uh, uh, idea from complexity theory. Now, it's not that every idea of here is is meaningful for for this system. Um, like, I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around nonlinearity and and think, does that you know mm, you know are there examples of that in orchestral music? Maybe I don't know. You know, uh, ideas around to chaos or something. I don't think so. I don't think that's uh, necessarily relevant. Um, but you know, trying these uh, trying these concepts out as heuristics is useful for me. And in particularly in the case of something like feedback loops, it kind of gives an explanation for a phenomenon that that musicians know about, right? That's a problem for us if we are slowing down or rushing or going, you know, uh, these kinds of problems. This gives a, a kind of way of thinking about that problem that's kind of novel to me um, and is, is interesting. Okay, I want to now um, look at a, uh, a specific example here and um, uh, I'll just play the beginning of this, and then we'll then we'll talk about networks uh, for a few minutes. <laughs> I'll stop it there. This is the beginning of Ludwig van Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, which was a uh, huge hit for him in the early 19th century. Uh, it continues to be played very often. In fact, this was the last symphony that I played in uh, with the London Community Orchestra 
before uh, the pandemic locked things down last year. So I'm interested in trying to use networks to model the, the patterns of coordination that we get here in a, in a piece like this. I'm interested in how, you know, a, a piece kind of choreographs patterns of interaction. Um, so if we're going to think of, you know, doing some network analysis with any kind of system, we have to make some decisions. We have to figure out what are going to be the, the nodes uh, in the network and what are going to be the links or, or edges that connect those nodes. What are the, you know, what are the elements that we're talking about and what are the relations that connect those elements. So here, you know, the nodes quite clearly are parts in the orchestra. They're not exactly individual players, at least not in the way that I'm approaching it. Maybe that would be possible too, but I'm treating this as the parts in the orchestra. So all of the viola section, we all play one part. For my purposes, that's going to be one node in the orchestra. But of course, you could do it differently and say, you know, each, each node is a person or, you know, some other way of doing it. Now, there are various ways then of of relating those parts and network analysis is an inherently relational approach if you don't have some relation among your your things that you're looking at then you can't use this so what i've you could do various things but what i'm mostly interested in is is in what we music theorists call onset synchrony and that just means um you know how many uh how many of our notes or attacks or musical events um, start at the same time when you when you have uh, you know two parts together. I'll show you a little bit what I mean by by looking at the score for the music that we just heard. This visual representation can maybe help clarify. So if we zoom in here, just look at the the woodwind section here, and the first uh, four measures, and just compare the bassoons and the flutes. You can see here. Uh, they share all of their attacks. Every time the flutes play, the bassoons play exactly at the same time. Um, and vice versa. Every time the bassoons play, the flutes play at the same time. So this is, you know, total onset synchrony, 100% onset synchrony. Um, uh, work on music cognition and music perception has, uh, and just auditory perception in general, has shown that when parts have this kind of relationship, our ears and our brain, minds will kind of tend to lump them into one stream. So we'll hear this as kind of one layer of the music. We're gonna hear those as, as being so together that we'll just hear that as kind of this one kind of thick thing instead of many separate things. If we instead look at the relation between the flutes and the oboes, we see that it's a little bit different. And this brings out how it's an asymmetrical relationship. So every time the flute has a note, the oboe has a note as well. But the oboe has a lot of notes that the flute doesn't play with. And so one in one direction, we have 100% on synchrony. And in the other direction, it's going to be much, much, much lower. Um, and this, in this case, what's generally going to happen then is the flutes and the bassoons, and as we'll see other parts, kind of have to follow the oboe. Um, we have to line up our events with its events because it, it is more independent than us. So um, the way that I, I do this analysis, um, and this is something that has really just been developing, I've just been working on recently uh, with some help from, from some marvelous undergraduate summer research in interns, is um, uh, putting this into some, uh, using some Python code uh, to um, to kind of calculate these uh, relations. Um, and it produces a matrix like this. So, you know, this is like, uh, as I was saying, from the flute to the bassoon is 100%, etc. And then what I can do is using the statistical software R is I can turn that into um, a network. Uh, and what we see, this is a network for those first, the first bit of music, which we heard, is we see that the oboe is kind of off on its own. There's a lot of arrows coming toward it. All these parts are kind of following that part. Similarly, as we get a little later, the clarinet starts to take on that role as well. And a lot of parts are starting to follow that part. And then we kind of have a cluster in the middle 
which is all very densely interconnected. All of these are kind of just all together and they're forming the same kind of musical stream or musical layer. So this is um, kind of an initial way of looking at this. As I said, each node is um, a part in the orchestra. I've color coded these to show you the different instrumental sections. So blue are brass, yellow are strings, uh, green is percussion, and uh, orange is woodwinds. And the size of the, the node corresponds with how many arrows are coming in, basically. So we can, if you could, it's kind of a little hard to see here, but you know, the oboe is kind of bigger than anything in this cluster. If we zoom out, and I don't think I'm going to play this again because I think I, I'm talking for long enough as it is. Uh, but if we zoom out and look at the entire introduction, which is a little bit longer than the, the passage we heard, um, then other kind of bigger level patterns start to emerge. You see that the first violin and the second violin and the cello are followed the most. And that kind of makes sense. The first violin is and second violin often have the tune, often have the main part. Whereas the viola section, which is where I live in the orchestra, uh, basically almost nobody is following us except for the horn, right? We play a more supporting role. Uh, that's something I enjoy about playing the viola. It's something that some people hate about playing viola and some violinists won't ever try it because of that. So there are these different kind of social roles in the orchestra. Um, you can see that, you know, some are very paired and very kind of tightly connected to each other. Um, and the spacing in this is all meaningful because it uses a, a certain algorithm sort of to show closeness visually um, in, in that from the net, from the uh, matrix. But then we can also use computational tools and, and, and mathematical tools from network analysis to find out interesting things. For example, in this network, the clarinet has the highest betweenness. It's, the, it's a, a kind of in-between connector kind of uh, role in this, uh, in this music. Um, so that if you took it out, if you took this node out, the, the network would suddenly become much more disconnected. Um, so that seems like an interesting musical thing to look into. Um, if, it, you know, if it has these properties in the network, um, you know, can we kind of look at that part and understand what it's doing musically, um, how it's, you know, probably basically coordinating with one group, coordinating with another group more than, you know, some other uh, parts, which may be just kind of, you know, follow the other strings for, for the viola, right? Basically, not really, I don't need to coordinate so much with those other parts, I can just basically follow the other strings. So in any case, there's a lot to unpack here. And of course, these are just two snapshots from a piece that has you know, thousands of notes and, and, and even more relations between pairs of notes. But I hope this gives you a sense of how you know, thinking of a system in terms of networks, kind of defining those nodes and some kind of relation can start to, um, again, give new insight into things that you maybe already knew but then also maybe uh, you know suggest new relations or new things going on in that system that you wouldn't have tuned into otherwise. Um, so I you know I'm very like I said I'm very new to all of this. This is not these are not tools that are generally used in my field. Um, but you know it it has been an exciting thing to learn about, and I find it very illuminating. And I think I just feel like there's a lot more for me to do with uh, with thinking about this. Um, oh, another thing is, you know, you can also use these tools to, to kind of uh, algorithmically identify communities within. So this will, you know, also tell me about uh, what kind of sub communities uh, are, or, or cliques are there within the orchestra. In any case, um, I just want to end by thanking, uh, thanking James, thanking uh, Kate and the CS Lab. The, the USRI program at Western has, has really been wonderful supporting this research and to acknowledge the wonderful undergrads that I've been working with uh, who've been helping me with all of this. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to James now uh, to move into the next part of the session. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Kate. Great presentations. I learned so much on a Monday morning. It was terrific. Before going uh, forward, the kind of the next section is uh, hopefully the opportunity for uh, us to have a discussion. So if there's anyone else in the call on the meeting here who has a question uh, for, for any of us, please um, 
go ahead and feel free to share it in whatever way you feel most uh, comfortable sharing. So feel free to come on screen and ask a question uh, or just uh, voice only or throw it in the chat box. Uh, either way, it is um, either way fine with us. Um, and maybe to give people a couple seconds to, uh, to formulate their question. Maybe Kate, can we come back to you with in Jonathan's presentation? Did, did you see any soil? Like, did you see any? Uh, what were some of the what were some of the, the things that jumped out for you? Oh yeah, that's a, a great question. Well, um, one of the things that I noticed early on, which I found really interesting, um, is uh, uh, the connection that uh, Jonathan was making between the um, the uh, musical ensemble and the brain, uh, because actually um, that's also that that sort of uh, uh, the the human body as a complex adaptive system, you know, the relationship be between that and uh, something like a musical ensemble. So the cognitive and the and the cultural um, was really interesting to me, and I think has some parallels. Um, and, and now I don't do sort of uh, cognitive work. But a lot of the reading that I've been doing recently actually does um, sort of uh, uh, develop some of the relationships between, say, um, neuroscience and environmental humanities. So I did notice some connections there. Um, uh, but that's sort of, uh, yeah, that's the main, my main sort of entry point in was there. But yeah, uh, and also just some of the ways that uh, Jonathan was talking about the feedback loops. And I was sort of imagining um, in my project, which is we've, we've just started the interviewing process. So it's pretty exciting now that we're able to do that. And um, thinking about um, the way that, uh, that those subtle changes, uh, because the, the Sunnyview Farm, um, which is our pilot site, uh, is really um, supposed to be, I, I guess, kind of like a contemporary commune. Uh, so it's, it's, really meant to be you you'll you in the interviews you hear the um founders talking about the ways that they don't need to um it, it sounds a bit funny but uh that they can communicate with cows um and they sort of know what the cows are thinking um and so there's and and there's these subtle shifts that take place according to how they adjust themselves to the cows and so just, I, I can see the parallels there, not necessarily any direct resonances, but um, I would be interested to see uh, how Jonathan might think of soil as well, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about soil, but uh, yeah, <laughs> really, but, um, uh, but I think there is still a lot of resonance here. Um, and I mean, this is also, part of the whole thing, the complexity theory being kind of inherently interdisciplinary, the, the possibilities for these connections are always there. So in terms of the cows thing, I actually, a graduate student in, in a cognitive musicology course I just taught last spring, wrote a fascinating paper about how, uh, about this uh, Swedish practice of kolning, which is uh, calling the animals through this kind of musical, this improvised musical practice, how this um, musical practice is a relational it, it involves the humans the animals but it also responds to the environment because it's uh, like yodeling it exploits the soundscape or the the kind of acoustic environment of the the mountains where they are to uh to try so that the sound is it kind of created in a way that it travels over long long distances um, and it's a very fascinating thing as well because it's a traditional practice where women are the herders and it's it kind of so it's kind of like layers and layers upon layers of things. Uh, but that's a way that sound and music kind of comes into that um, uh, into that practice and into the kind of um, interspecies, you know, uh, you know, kind of a sense of relation with the animals and the environment, right? Um, I mean, I like your, I mean, uh, you know, for me, I'm, you were talking about, you know, uh, soil as a relational medium. And uh, the term relational medium seems really great to me. And, and that's kind of how I'm think, trying to think about music as a relational medium, right? We kind of, I, I, there's a tradition of thinking about things like Beethoven's Seventh Symphony as though it's an object, right? As though it's a thing, right? Um, and I am very much more trying to think of um, 
you know, uh, a, a music as a, a, a medium for people to relate to each other, as something that people do with each other in, uh, in real time. And, you know, just like, uh, you know, social network diagram might show who are your kind of friends and who are your friends of friends, my network diagrams of the, of the orchestra kind of again show you know, which parts are really close to you and really tight and which which are kind of more peripheral and so on. Uh, so yeah, that idea of thinking about probably a lot of things could be understood as a relational medium. And so I thought that was really interesting uh, to, to, for soil. I felt like for some of those questions, I could just like find and replace soil with music and the question would still make sense and would actually be a version of what I'm trying to ask. I think we have a few things in the chat, so that's great, thank you. Let's uh, turn to those. Yeah, Maybe. so uh, when Nick asked this, this, this question about you know, whether specific contributions to the study of social antagonism, exploitation conflicts, or does this get washed out of it in the emphasis on adaptive systems? And I think, I think if you were taking a purely adaptive uh, lens or maybe like a lens highly focused on the kind of evolutionary aspect, uh, um, of of complexity, I could I would I could definitely see that. And again, I'm not speaking as the expert here. Right? It's interesting though, thinking of uh, the adaptive system parts of of complex adaptive systems as part of a broader uh, community of complexity, in which you have things like um, game theory, not to not to say antagonism and exploitation are games, but but from the from the political science perspective, there's been quite a bit of, of work about looking at conflict um, through a complexity lens and looking at um, you know, uh, social uprisings. Uh, you know, there's even around the Arab Spring, there was some significant uh, some significant literature on on even modeling. You know, what we were seeing and trying to think through. You know, what what are the you know, what are some of those myriad of uh, factors uh, that are you know contributing to um, to a debate about power. <laughs> um, that, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Anyone else? I, and if you're on the call, I have, uh, oh, I mean, I have something to get in it. Sorry. Sorry, I'm reading, reading chat. Uh, well, I mean, we should go to Elena's comment. It was just, just as a, as a, uh, it, I, and again, I'm kind of very new to this stuff, but a lot of the, the work that I've uh, kind of been, trying to learn from in terms of network uh, analysis is coming from sociology. And uh, there, there's there's definitely work. Some of it, I think, is foundational. You can see there's these kind of, I don't know if you can see this, but there are these pluses and minuses there. And they're trying to think about complex dynamics in terms of conflicts within, uh, within groups and patterns. Uh, uh, patterns there. Um, so some of that uh, work from from sociology, I think, is, is is really using network tools to try to think about antagonism and conflict and and so on in some way. But I'm really not familiar with that work directly. I've kind of mo mostly just uh, accessed it through these secondary sources. Um, so I don't know whether you know how well that would address your uh, your question. Um, yeah, but James, James, do you want to maybe read out uh, Elena's comment here? Because this seems really valuable. At the, uh, the comment was, in my own research, I did a critique on the need for greater attention to power and political dynamics that are always accounted for in the ways that complex adaptive systems are mobilized, partly because of the focus on structures uh, than dynamics themselves. So, and there's a call out to further uh, Collaborate on that question, which is and more importantly, I am here and I'm so happy that you are here. <laughs> and I'm so sorry that I'm joining you late, but I was drafted in, an, in another meeting at the last uh, moment. I am a new colleague, I've only just uh, joined. Um, and uh, to me, seeing the announcement about the existence of this uh, group um, actually made my joining uh, Westerns even more exciting and valuable. I, I am so happy that you are propelling us to think think about this agenda, it is exactly what we as scholars and as an academic institution need to be doing more because it is one of those few areas where you can see true 
transdisciplinarity take shape. Uh, so I'm so happy to see the work you're doing, Jonathan. I think it's really powerful. I can't wait until we can have a coffee so I can dig my, my mind and enhance, as it were, closer to your research. The comment I wanted to make, and I'm so grateful that Nick has raised it, is um, I've been working with complexity science for well, I finished my PhD in 1997. Now you know how old I am. Uh, and my PhD thesis was a, a theory of, I called it a study of interrelationships. But for me, it was an attempt to push the boundaries of systems thinking, which still, dare I tell you, at least in some disciplines, seems to be the underlying logic that defines the character on adaptiveness that complex adaptive systems as a theory are largely looking to address. There is no doubt that in systemic thinking, we recognize the coexistence, what we would otherwise refer to as symbiosis in any given context in any whether you talk about um, nature whether you talk about a, a, a social group or symphony or any form of structure that en entails multiple contributors with diverse and not necessarily unique as in um, coherent or um, homogeneous qualities is by its very nature complex and systemic because the focus is on interrelationships. And Jonathan is absolutely right that network and gaming theories so far have been the ways in which we were looking to map and define the connections. And more often than not, some of us, in my case, I was trying to use different um, um, ways, the quality of the connection. That's why I wanted to move the debate from systems Cishetisms. Cis I'm Greek, so you have to forgive me for that. Uh, Cishetisms means interconnectivity. This means that our focus is to understand why is it that we connect, not just simply relate, not only uh, recognizing that in, this, in any systemic notion that there are subsystems which behave as whole systems and that the sum is greater than the individual parts, which is the governing logic that we have working with this. The emphasis in moving forward, especially because of COVID that we are called upon to try and understand more, is what defines and what undermines our connection. And for me, COVID was the best complex adaptive system that I've seen so far because it broke the notion of adaptiv adap adaptiveness. It really challenged us to see the escalation effect of the virus in the way in which we needed to agile respond and not just wait and react. And that to me is the next phase of this work. And that's where I need some support from all of you out there for us to think, how can we position our voice in this wider debate? You might come across the Kinevin Institute. This is the only institute internationally that is doing some serious work in some of this space. And they have been actually, more importantly, applying it to real life. So in response, this is a, a well, you know, rounded way of saying, Nick, Yes, you've touched the, the, the most critical nerve in all this discussion. The, the tensions are critical to the extensions that connectivity can facilitate. But understanding tensions is not being negative is the next challenge we are perforce to also embrace. And we are at the forefront of this because I, I think what is amazing for me as an outsider is the beauty of the debate we are having around the equality, diversity and inclusion. For whatever be, may be the recent events and you know situations that we are coming that propel us to recognize the need for greater justice, equality, I believe the whole issue of tension needs to be placed in not only tolerating conflict or diversity, but understanding this notion of um, interbeing. This is where the next phase of debate is, is heading. And interbeing is taking seen biosis into the notion that Haraway is presenting, which she calls symbiosis co-creation. So we're moving from co-existence to co-creation. And co-creation is about maximizing the connections because of the tensions. It's enough for one go, but thank, thank you for you. allowing me to bring my voice to this. And I just so look forward to more discussions subsequently.
Uh, thank you so much for coming for your contribution. It's great to meet you as well. Welcome to Western. Great to have you I'm here. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I think the uh, there's so much more. I mean, we 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 should probably just hold uh, we should probably just hold a, a collaborative discussion on 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 pushing the discussion around uh, not to overly dilute what we've been talking about, but but push this is the discussion on where the descriptive and the normative meet in the complexity world. Um, I, I don't want to I don't want to over summarize, but I think that would be a great point to at least uh, move the discussion forward. Um, it's it's important that we end at 1130 uh, because there's another session uh, as a part of this conference that people probably want to go to. Um, so uh, I had a few things to, to mention about the lab, but I think this discussion has been far more productive anyway. Um, so please check out cas.uwo.ca for information about the lab if you are looking for it. Uh, happy to answer uh, any questions. Feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Thank you, uh, Research Western, for pulling this um, session together. Thank you, um, Jonathan and Kate, for for your presentations and your input. It's been terrific. Um, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Have a lovely day. <laughs>